Thank you, thank you. Thank you, thank you. So is the sound working okay? You can hear me? Okay. A little louder. Yeah, just lean into it more. Lean into it more. Okay. <laughs> All right. I'll lean into it more. There you go. Okay. So I have some slides. I only have half an hour, uh, of which five minutes have already expired. <laughs> so, um, and I want to leave five or seven minutes at the end, and so I'm asking for a signal for questions. As usual, I have way too much to say, so I'm going to go through some slides just very, uh, relatively quickly here, uh, just to give you some background. I'm writing a series of uh, seven books, actually, of which six have appeared. And they're all short books, so you don't have to worry. They're all like 100 pages, or plus or minus 10, and uh, they're kind of summarizing everything I've learned. Uh, that's was the first two, uh, expansion of consciousness, which is a very uh, useful concept that I think Leary and our project at Harvard was actually instrumental in introducing into the, into the field. Uh, why can't you hear me? No, I, uh, I'm trying to, I have a microphone here. So, can you hear me now? Okay. I don't know why I couldn't hear, but that's good. Okay, so the, the notion of expansion of consciousness, really, uh, Leary introduced that, and that was a, a contribution he made that um, most people still to this day don't think of consciousness as something that can be expanded, or it can also be contracted, which is very important to realize. And, um, and Hoffman himself actually really liked that concept, and I now prefer to use that concept than the notion of psychedelic, because psychedelic, <laughs> has uh, <coughs> uh, acquired all kinds of other meanings and other associations of cultural associations and illegality and all kinds of things like that. And, uh, consciousness expansion is very interesting to think about. It's actually a very common process. It happens every morning when you wake up from sleep because you might be dreaming in some scene, you know, and then you, then you start to open your eyes, you become aware, you become aware that oh, you're, you're lying in your bed, in your room, in your house, in your garden, in your job, in your, in your world, your culture, and where you live. That's a process of consciousness expansion that happens all the time. And, uh, and contractions of consciousness are equally common. Uh, it's called concentration. <laughs> when you're concentrating on something, like you're right now, you're concentrating on what you're hearing and you know, taking it in, I'm concentrating on you, what I'm saying. And uh, that concentration is voluntary and, you know, and, and, and changes. And when you're doing your job, you're doing something, anything that requires skill, you're concentrating. And uh, yeah. you can't hear me. Why is that? I'm speaking louder. I'm speaking too fast. I don't know. I, I, I don't know why you can't hear me. Uh, so um, anyway, so the basic idea of expansion versus contraction being perfectly normal processes. No, I'm t I have a mic here. Okay, my, I, think, I think it might be better to speak into the big mic. Cause yeah, just well. I cannot hear you. Really? Yeah, how about that? Try now. Um, okay, well. Yes. Okay. Whoa. Yeah, see, now you're getting too much feedback. <laughs> okay, I think I should just go on here. So those are the next two books I wrote. Um, Alchemical Divination, Accessing Your Spiritual Intelligence for Healing and Guidance. That, to me, is the key process. Um, and um, the idea of psychedelic drugs, you know, it comes in, uh, the point is, uh, they're, they're tools and they can be used for accessing your spiritual intelligence for healing and guidance. But they can also, and are used, for other purposes. And uh, there's nothing inherent in the drug that gives uh, its use, because they can be misused and abused and uh, used for nefarious purposes, uh, as they were by the military intelligence people. Uh, and um, so that's a concept I want to get at uh, describing the actual processes that are, can be triggered and amplified by these drugs, but not to think of them as a drug effect. <laughs> it's not a drug effect. <laughs> the drug effect is very neutral and very general, um, a heightening of certain brain processes. What you do with it and what your intention is, is always the key, key is always the intention. So I'm just going to go on here to the next slide. And then mind space and time stream is the idea understanding and navigating your states of consciousness. That every state of consciousness you're in has its own space-time parameters. Like this, we call this uh, ordinary state of consciousness, uh, actually the sort of uh, where you're focused on real time, consensual real time and space. 
Now, but any other state of consciousness, whether it's a drug-induced or whether it's a dream, for example, we all know that a dream state of consciousness has its completely own time and space, right? You can dream that you travel to visit your grandmother who lives 2,000 miles away. It doesn't take any time at all. It's subjective time. It's emotional time. It's how close you feel to somebody. So time and space laws at every level of consciousness are different. That's what changes. So, uh, and that's what you want to then be able to learn to navigate these differences of time-space parameters and navigate your way through them for the purposes for which you've taken, you know, uh, in, gone into the altered state or expanded state. Um, so the next uh, book that I wrote then is I call The Life Cycle of the Human Soul. <coughs> And it goes into all the research that's been, a lot of research been done in the last 50 years, uh, looking at prenatal experience and post-mortem experience. And that ties into the work we did in the 60s in translating the Tibetan Book of the Dead. I don't have time to go on to this, but anyway, the, I just want to mention these key events in the life cycle of the human soul. Incarnation. That's when the soul decides to come into, wor into the world again. And then conception. That's the first actual in the time, space, physical dimension. Once, you, once conception happens, you commit it. Of course, you know, you can, the, the soul can uh, back off. <laughs> the soul can back out of human life at any point. <laughs> child may not make it to birth, the fetus may not make it to birth, and you can die at any point after death. So conception, the milestones are birth, then death, and then the hereafter, what happens after birth, and then reincarnation, the next cycle. That's the basic cycle. So in that book I talk about the different aspects of that cycle, especially the ones before birth and the after death. And then uh, the one after that is the six pathways of destiny. It's about six major paths in life that we all have, the artist, the musician, poet, the explorer, scientist, the teacher, historian, the warrior, guardian, the healer, peacemaker, and so forth. So we don't have time to go into all of that, but I just quickly click, click on this book, which I recommend you get. This is a kind of a history that Ramdas and I, with Gary Bravo, uh, put together in conversational form, published by Synergetic Press. And um, this is a book of poems. Uh, I was born in Germany, and I'm a bilingual. I teach in Germany. and. German and English have been you know, very f fond of the language of the literature of both. So this is an anthology of poems, not mine, but other people's poems. Eye of the Series and Voice of the Poet. It's a totally bilingual book from German and English. One side uh, German, one side English. Okay, now going on to the next slide. These are the two people who I sort of regard as my uh, uh, spiritual ancestors. Um, and. Uh, Jung for his uh, groundbreaking uh, exploration as a psychologist, I was trained as a psychologist for his groundbreaking uh, recognition of what, what are called generally collective unconscious, which is not a term that I particularly like, because, uh, but it's uh, the idea of collective images that we all share, or nowadays people would say memes. Ar archetypes is another term like that. The reason I don't like the, un the term of the unconscious, because the whole point is, you, you talk about the, the unconscious, you're, you're doing something that linguists call reification, as if the unconscious is an actual place somewhere. And it's not. There is no place. There is no layer of the brain that's unconscious. Anything can be unconscious. Any thought, any feeling, any image, any perception can be unconscious, or it can become conscious. And this is the one, one of the big differences between Eastern and Western psychology. Because Eastern psychology, whether it's based on the Hindu uh, uh, Advaita Vedantist or in the Buddhist thing, uh, uh, assume that the, uh, I'm getting an echo here, the base state, the, the baseline state, the default state, is a state of unconsciousness. And uh, whereas in the West, psychology tends to assume, well, consciousness is sort of, you know, kind of this abstraction that we're, you know, that we have unconscious states when we get knocked out, we pass out, we're in a coma or we're in a sleep state like that, different states of uh, un varieties of unconsciousness. But actually, uh, I, don't, I don't know that I'm doing that. I'm just, I'm just going back and forth. Um, because this one is still on. Where is it? That one is on. Let's try this one turned off. Okay. Okay. All right. Um, yeah. 
then I have to lean forward like that, which is, I guess is okay. So, uh, so that's the basic idea I want to get across there, that um, um, it's more helpful, I find it more helpful uh, to um, go with the Hindu and Buddhist and Eastern philosophies which say that unconsciousness is um, the baseline state that we have. You know, we're not, and, and it's interesting that neuroscientists now tell us this. We're, uh, I remember Eric Kandel, he wrote a book about the brain and unconsciousness, the Nobel Prize winner. He said 99% of what we do and think every day is un totally unconscious. Like you unconsciously get up in the morning and all the bodily processes is all unconscious. See? And uh, the habits we have and you know, getting, getting up and driving to work and you know, it's all pretty much unconscious. And the whole purpose of meditation is to become more conscious. They call it mindfulness training. <laughs> And then people will start mindfulness training, they realize how difficult it is to become conscious. We have a sort of, it's a kind of a spectrum, you know, it's not black or white, it's a spectrum. We can always become more conscious, and we can also become more unconscious. And it's kind of a gradual, you know, and, and some of you, if, you, if, the, if my lecture is boring, or you know, in a talk, and you're sitting in a movie theater, and it's kind of hot, and maybe you're tired, you, you might find yourself sinking gradually into unconsciousness, and you know, partial unconsciousness, and then suddenly wake up, and realize, it's like that. So think of it as a, spe a spectrum of variety of states of attention and consciousness. So Jung, I think, uh, by pointing out there these archetypal basic images that are shared by, by a whole culture, and maybe by the whole world, uh, images of a divine child, for example, or images of the divine mother or the divine father, it's kind of core images are shared by all cultures. And of course, they have different names in the different cultures. Uh, and we call them gods and goddesses in mythology, but the archetypes are kind of a core uh, like that. And then uh, Hoffman, see, uh, Jung never had the idea, he didn't have any consciousness expanding experiences with substances. In a way, he, he used to say mescaline was, was available at the time. He didn't want to try it because he felt he enough, had enough access to the unconscious that it would be redundant for him to do that and possibly harmful. Uh, and he, he's probably right, and, and you have a right to make that judgment. So, um, and, um, but he, so he talked about these unconscious, um, conscious, but it's, it's all the psychological, see, and the mental, the emotional, and the spiritual dimensions. What he didn't have is the recognition that the, at the physical dimension, there could be a substance that could actually trigger uh, different changes in awareness. Of course, he knew about anesthetics and things like that. But he didn't know and didn't understand the significance of what we now call psychedelic drugs, or I prefer the term consciousness expanding drugs. These are unlike any other drugs. Like, you, you know, you've probably had that experience. You had some friend asked you, what, what, what does this drug do? You really kind of can't explain it, you know. It's not like an antibiotic or a painkiller or a sleeping pill or it doesn't do anything except, um, it, dep it all depends. It's the only correct answer, I think. It all depends. <laughs> it depends on what does it depend on? So that, see, that was Leary's uh, groundbreaking insight, the set and the setting. So Leary said, it all depends on set and setting. And Hoffman really liked that idea. Um, and this is the formula that I now use. This is, to me, the core formula that um, is worth remembering. Your intention or your question determines what you will pay attention to. It's interesting to even see uh, the connection in the language. And then that, in turn, determines what you will become aware of. Like, you all have the intention to hear what I'm going to say and present like that, and so then you're paying attention, for, for which I thank you. Uh, paying attention is actually a gift, right? It's, the word pay is even like that. In German, you say, schenk die Aufmerksamkeit, it's a gift. Um, because I could be talking here and you wouldn't be paying attention, then, you know, there would be no, no communication would take place. And then you, then you become aware of what it is you're paying attention to. And if you're, uh, but your attention could also be captured. For example, if a naked woman walked into the room, our attention would probably be captured and you would not you know, pay much attention to me anymore for a while, <laughs> which would be okay. But, uh, 
see, so it all depends on your attention, but it's not a fixed thing. It's a, your atten intention, after all, is a choice, you see? And um, so, um, and now brain scientists are actually to the point where they can measure at what point in the brain the intention to do something occurs and where it's measured and how fast before, it's microseconds, you know, before the actual response that might take place. Of, like, like that, of perception. And intention, I say intention or question could, could be, like in therapy, you know, for example, which is my field, and I take therapy, so the intention is to, is to somebody might say, well, my intention is to <clears throat> heal my relationship with my father. Or he could also formulate the intention as a question. Uh, he could call the therapist and say, how can I heal my relationship to my father? Do you feel the difference between the two? The one is more like an arrow pointing in a certain direction, uh, maybe because you have a specific situation between you and your father that you know that uh, what it is. It's sort of like uh, it's it's sort of like intention and question is sort of like hunting and gathering, <laughs> you know, that, which are pretty basic activities in human beings. Right? Hunting is like you know what you're looking for and you're tracking, tracking and using scent to find where the prey that you're looking for is located. And, uh, but gathering is not like that because you don't know where you're going to find it. You have to look around. You, know, you don't know what the cause of the difficulty is. Maybe you have a difficulty in your relationship with your father, but you don't know what the cause is. And uh, so you, uh, and that applies to any kind of situation. So intention or question determine, what the arrow means, determine what you're going to pay attention to, and that in turn determines what you come a, uh, become aware of. Okay, so, so then this is my general model of all the states of consciousness. In all the state of consciousness, there are uh, alterations in thinking, feeling, uh, perception, the sense of time and space, very important, as we just talked about because you can have you know, alterations of thinking and feeling, and it's not a different, different state. Body image, sense of self. Okay, I'm gonna run out of time, so I'm just gonna give you a couple of more of these images. Uh, they're from my books. Um, I wanna leave it a little time. See, this is happening. This is another formula I have. So, uh, when you're, uh, what I call the, Janus model divination integration. So in the middle is your, your present field of awareness and identity, your personal life world, I would call it, and what you're doing. And then when you're doing therapy and uh, you're going regression, retrieval, or recollection to a back to a memory image, and then remembering, which is my favorite word in the English language because it means reconnecting that which has been really disconnected and dismembered, and remem remembering the significance of it. Just getting a memory flashback is not necessarily a, a therapeutic thing, as we know. You have to then integrate that memory into your present sense of identity, so you can say, yes, that happened to me. Uh, this is why traumatic amnesia, see? Traumatic amnesia feels this whole connection is, uh, is, dis is cut off. Maybe there was an explosion, you know, that killed uh, people, but I can't connect that to my life. I can't integrate it into the concept of who I am. And that's where traumatic memory work with PTSD is that that's the key, you see, making that connection. So you can say, yes, I had that memory, but it's not gonna now bother me as flashbacks and disturb me. I have somehow integrated into my sense of who I am, like that. And a similar double process happens in when you get looking into the future, you get a future vision, but having a future vision per se is not necessarily helpful or doesn't lead to anything unless you can somehow express it, right? And if you don't express it, it just becomes a fantasy. <laughs> yeah, so maybe I'll be a great artist someday, <laughs> but if I don't do anything to become an artist, you know, that's not gonna be realized. It'll remain on a level of fantasy. So then the key there is realizing it, making it, you know, bringing it back into the present so they take the steps. You, know, you go to art school and da da da, like uh, get apprenticed and learn. Uh, so, uh, so then I'll say, uh, I, I think I'm gonna skip that because um, I don't have time, but it's, it's basically a repeat of the vision before that it's more expanding the, the present field. The present field, I call it a, it's a systems view. The self is a system of relations. 
with, uh, the self is a system of relations with other humans, animals, plants, spirit beings, ancestors, deities, physical body, energy field, family, group, community, society, humanity, places, origin, you know, where, I, where I come from, where, where my home is, ref vision, refuge, and earth and worldview, right? That's all part of your self-concept. Imagine someday we're gonna meet people from other planets, ETs, you know, and you'll say, oh, my name is so-and-so, I'm from planet Earth, the third planet out from the sun. Where are you from? Hello, nice to meet you. <laughs> like that, right? It's part of your worldview, it's part of your world. Okay, um, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna quickly go. These are two uh, serpent images, these are yogic images. And uh, it's actually, one, one is, uh, you know, for, for practice, for meditative practice. One is uh, the staff of Asclepius, God was the healing, healing god, it's a single serpent. And the staff of Hermes, called the Caduceus, is double serpent. Actually, in, in modern Western culture, the Hermes staff has been uh, co-opted, or so to speak, as the staff of the medical profession. That's actually not the right one. That's the yogic staff, because that refers to the two yogic channels of Ida and Pingala, uh, yin yang, uh, that yogis use, and, and Hermes is the visionary deity that goes to different levels of consciousness. The Asclepius staff, I think, refers to the, to the uh, vagus nerve, because the vagus nerve is the one nerve in the body that's not bilateral, see? It's a single nerve, and it connects the back of the brain. It's very ancient, and connects the upper and the lower parts, and uh, uh, that's what the he uh, healing works with, integrating the, the physical, veget vegetative, and physiological, and then the, you know, the, the human functions. Um, and then this is just uh, what I call an alchemical image decoded. On the left is an alchemical emblem. The alchemists were yogic spiritual practitioners and who coded all their teachings in symbolic codes because the Catholic Church, which was dominant at that time, 16th, 17th century, um, made it a heresy to do that. So they have these mysterious emblems. The fourfold sphere rules this work of love. This is from the 17th century. And so then I impose, superimpose the human body. This is a yogic, you can see this is a yogic practice. It's wor working with yoga of fire, uh, light fire, in four parts of the body, you know, the, the uh, vegetative, autonomic, the, the, heart, the physical lower chakras, and then the heart chakra, and then, uh, and, and see, you see the connection. <laughs> the outhouse is right next to the lower one, you see? That, that's the symbolic indicator, this is, that's, that's what they're saying. You, you have to superimpose those four spheres on the physical body. Uh, and then the one above that connects to the spiritual. And then I'll just show you quickly a couple of images uh, about ayahuasca being prepared. An ayahuasca serpent. And the serpent uh, imagery in ayahuasca paintings by Pablo Amaringo look very much like intestinal tract. And you notice that? You know, which is what, of course, the pro one of the primary actions of ayahuasca is the purging, the intestinal purging, which then is a prelude to the kind of opening and clarifying uh, and detoxifying consciousness in general. And then you might get these kinds of images of the dancing vegetative spirits that are singing their songs and like that. And then just, just to quickly stop, although we're actually out of time, two alchemical models. Mottos, which are very interesting. Natura, uh, they're both true. Natura naturans means nature being natural. Nature doing its thing naturally. And that's uh, an aspect, uh, that's a model for healing. Uh, you know, you, and all the naturopathic, uh, homeopathic, uh, Indian healing, um, Chinese, um, uh, Ayurveda, uh, acupuncture, all of those work with restoring the body's natural healing forces. And uh, the body heals itself, that's the idea. But they also have, equally important, opus contra natura. The work goes against nature. <laughs> so what does that mean? It means you, uh, to develop consciousness, you have to counteract the habitual processes that make you go unconscious. 
and do things in a way that's conscious, which is mindfulness, you see. Mind, uh, not mindful is unconscious, it's basically automatic. You just do everything automatic. You get up in the morning, you shave, and comb your hair, go to work, it's all automatic. <laughs> Opus contra natura, you want to sit down and do practice mindfulness, do mindful thinking. That's Opus contra natura. So both are valid. Both, you know, are healing. You want to follow nature, do things naturally, but also you develop consciousness, you have to counteract inertia, because nature has inertia. So I think with that, I'll stop. I'm sorry uh, we ran out of time, but maybe we have time for one question or something. Uh, yeah, so thank you very much. For Well, I think uh, conscious uh, uh, preparation for death is, is one of the two main key areas of uh, psychedelic research at the present time, and one that deserves to be uh, supported and encouraged and broadened and deepened, uh, because this culture is, uh, conception of death is uh, infantile. I would say it's infantile. It's a child's conception of death in a material world view which says, well, we don't really know anything that happens, so let's assume nothing happens. And the vast majority of people have that concept. And it's not true. It is not true and it never has been true. And that's not that it's a belief system. <laughs> that's a fact. And in your heart, you know it. And uh, there are ancient traditions in all cultures, including the Western culture, that recognized that and had, you know, deep and complex uh, practices. And in my book, Life Cycle of the Human Soul, I talk about that. The mystery religions were exactly that. And the work on, um, uh, with psychedelics and preparing people for dying, I think, is the most advanced work that's being done at the moment, in addition to the work on PTSD because um, in the work of Charlie Grobe and, and, and some of the other people uh, you know, who are facing uh, mortal illnesses. And you can see on the website, you can look on my website, you have a link to two films where uh, uh, psychedelic psilocybin was given to two women who had had uh, a death sentence, basically. And it's, a, it's also a tribute to the fact that the regulatory system has given permission for this kind of research to be done, for a drug to be used for preparation for dying, you see. That's, uh, normally drugs doesn't get approved unless you have a specific illness that it's curing. Well, these are people that, are not, that don't have an illness. They've been told that you're incurable. You're going to die within three months. So the, the fact that, that, that I think it's a very significant socio-political breakthrough that those, that research has been done. And I think because there's so much massive misunderstanding of what death is and the results have been totally staggering and amazing because people have one experience with psilocybin or something like that and their whole attitude and their whole life, everything changes completely and they die peacefully, peacefully. What a gift that is. So I think with that, let's leave it. Uh,